Hello there, my name is Gav, Gav Cross, and I am a storyteller. And it has been my pleasure in the past to have told stories in Manchester libraries before. I've been in Manchester libraries. I've borrowed Manchester libraries books. I've said words out loud in Manchester libraries. I've been told to keep quiet in Manchester libraries. <laughs> I've laughed in Manchester libraries with school children and their teachers and mums and dads and passing people who've been drawn in by a story. <laughs> and it is my utter pleasure to spend a little bit of your time with you telling you a story tonight. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to... Um, well, we'll assess whether or not it was a pleasure at the end because one of the things I could potentially do is ruin your childhood forever. But that's a risk I'm prepared to take because for me, well, I'm fascinated by stories. I am not just telling them, finding them, reading them, sharing them, questioning them. And my theory is this, that many stories we tell children that have been passed down again and again and again are not really suitable for children whatsoever. In fact, the story I'm going to tell you, which is a story you probably know, given a little twist by me, that's what I do, I take stories and twist them. In my version, it's a ghost story. Are you ready for a ghost story? You might not be ready for a ghost story. I understand. I'm not always ready for a ghost story myself. I'll try and get you ready for a ghost story. I'll try and prove my theory. Now, I don't know if you've noticed. I'm actually quite old. Not old, old, old. Old, old, probably. But when I was young and little, and I was young and little once, I was given books. I was lucky enough to be given books. I borrowed books. I devoured books. Not literally. Maybe. <laughs> Here's some books from my childhood. <laughs> Ladybird books. I love them. But I'm going to tell you something. This particular Ladybird book... Not only was it a huge part of my childhood, it was also a huge part of my dreams, my nightmares. Look at this terrifying giant trying to stomp and sniffing the blood and grinding bones. Is that for children? Really? And what about this one? Run. Run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Now, I'm about to spoil this story for you. So if you'd want to avoid spoilers for the gingerbread man, well, put your fingers in your ears right now. Run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. And the gingerbread man gets eaten. The whole book, which as a child I thought was about opportunity and hope actually ends in total despair. Ah, he gets eaten by someone trying to help him. And this chap, Rumpelstiltskin, sitting there, working out how to keep a child, to take a child. I'm sorry, none of these, none of these should be shared with children, should they? What about these? The clues in the title. Grimm's. Oh, yes, it does say fairy tales. Oh, and of course, there's lots of recognisable stories in here. Oh, you've got uh, Rapunzel. Ah, oh, you've got, uh, we've, you've got oh, oh, the very highly recognisable story, Donkey Wart. You know that one, don't you? Uh, you've got uh, Little Red Riding Hood. We'll come back to that one. Uh, you've got, of course, a Snow White. Yes, Tom Thumb. Yes, the house in the wood. You know that? 
Oh, you can guess. Any story about a house in a wood. Oh, it's going to be a barrel of laughs. It's got Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel. How can that be for children? Children thrown out in the forest by their own parents with the hope that they... I can't bring myself to say it. Children thrown into the forest twice with the hope that they'll never... Well, I, I can't bring myself to describe it. I don't think it's right. Children forced to push a little old lady into a burning oven. Look at all these lovely, pretty pictures and colours. Ah, and that's what happens. That's what, that's what we tell our children. Oh, yes. It's OK, children, because one way out is to push the old lady into the fire. Now, this book here uh, is a very old book, not as old as me. And this was written by a chap called Charles Perrault a long, 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 long time ago. A French chap. And sometimes we know his stories as... The Mother Goose Tales. Mother Goose Tales. Aren't they lovely? Stories for children by Mother Goose. Ah, Now, in this book, you've got the story of uh, Little Red Riding Hood, probably written down for the first time. Oh, Little Red Riding Hood. That not at all troubling story of a mother so uh, indifferent to the safety of her own child, she sends them into a forest full of wolves with one piece of advice, which is don't step off the path, because, of course, as we know, wild wolves are followers of the country code. And then, of course, we know how it ends, don't we? We know how it ends. Um, a, a little Red Riding Hood turns up to see her grandmother, who's obviously infirm, needs a basket of food, who's been eaten by a wolf. Now that's glossed over. In your heads, when you're a child, you're kind of suggested that the wolf comes in, yum, 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 gone. This is a wolf eating a grandmother. Do you not think as Little Red Riding Hood is walking in and looking around, she's not seeing the results of... Let's not go there. Oh, no. And then what happens in the end, of course, a Little Red Riding Hood, in some version, get eaten. In others, oh, she gets nicely placed in a wardrobe. Well, that's the newer ones. In some versions, she gets eaten. And then a woodcutter, a passing woodcutter, while he's there visiting Granny, we don't know, comes in, chops up the wolf. Out falls Little Red Riding Hood, out falls Granny, everyone's fine. <laughs> no, not in the original version. Not in the Mother Goose version. This is a moralistic story, a teaching story, a story that says if you are stupid enough and it doesn't matter how many clues you've been given, if you are stupid enough to be eaten by a wolf, oh, grandma, what big eyes you've got, all the better to see you with, my dear. Oh, grandmother, what big arms you've got. All the better to hug you with, my dear. Oh, grandmother, what big teeth you've got. All the better. To, well, you know what happens. That is a girl given multiple clues that this is not a good situation. And the best thing to do is to get out, because we know out there there's a woodcutter with an axe. No, she gets eaten. And in the original version, that's it. That is it. Little Red Riding Hood does not get saved. Her granny does not get saved. And at the end of it, basically, in translation, I would roughly state that the moral is some people you'll meet in life are stupid enough to be eaten by wolves. Like Little Red Riding Hood. Don't be one of those. Don't be 
Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, but somebody decided, oh, that's too nasty for children. Let's make it nice without any thought to the poor wolf. Now, I am going to tell you a story, which again is part of this and is a story that you know. But I'm going to twist it. I like doing that with stories. I think that's one of the key skills that we can do. Take a story we know and think, well, what about if we told it from a different point of view? From a character we haven't yet met. From a character who we have, but we've not really thought about. And that's why I'm going to call this story Ghost. When will you work out which story it is? Now, it's OK. I don't think there are ghosts, so they've got nothing to worry about when it comes to a ghost story. Sorry. They tell me that tonight I will see a ghost. I don't believe in ghosts. No, no, no. Let me explain. This isn't my house. I've lived here all my life. I was born here. But it isn't my house. It's her house. Not my mother's. My mother was born in this house. It's her house. Her mother's. My grandmother. Now, I never met my grandmother. No, no, no. My own mother is long gone. She died of old age. A long life, but a happy life. Well, it was a life of sadness. When I was a child, I, I didn't see it. But as I grew older, that's when I saw it behind her eyes. She missed her own mother, my grandmother. My grandmother left this house 100 years ago. This very day. This village used to be prosperous. This village used to be full of people. People that worked in the castle. The castle on the hill. You can't see the hill anymore. It's covered with forest and bracken and briar. It's completely inaccessible. In fact, I've never seen it. So thick is all the vegetation around it. It is just a story to me that there's a castle in there. It's a story that brings silly princes every now and again to try their luck. They've heard the legends. They've heard the myths. They've heard the fairy stories. I don't believe in fairy stories. I've told them to my own children, of course. They've all moved on. But I'm connected to this one. A hundred years ago, you see, my grandmother in this house with her six children, my mother, was the youngest. Every morning, she would get up before the dawn to rekindle the fire, to put on it a pot, to feed that fire, to feed that pot with food for her children. She would wake her eldest daughters, who would tend the food, tend the fire, clean the house, as she went off to work. My mother was raised by her sisters because she left and never came back. She was a scullery maid. She scrubbed the stone in the castle till it polished to a shine. Imagine that stone covered in the mud of the boots of the king, of the queen, of those princes that visit, those that go hunting, the noblemen that take their bows and arrows into the forest and come in with a laugh to the soldiers that beat their boots on the stone. She had to clean it and scrub it. Now, my grandfather had long since died. He was a soldier for the king who'd gone off with the king and the king had returned with gold and lands, but my grandfather didn't, apparently. It was a common story in these parts. My grandmother, she used to be skilled. She made these tapestries. They're old and frail now, but they are still beautiful. But she was banned from making any more, from any more sewing, any more weaving, any more spinning. On the day that she was born, the day the princess was born, some talk of a curse, some talk of a witch. I don't believe any of that. So my mother was reduced to penury, to poverty, unless she 
scrubbed the stone floors. Now, apparently that day there was a party. This princess had grown to be of 18 of age. So all of the princes, all of the wealthy, all of the landed gentry came to the party and stood on the floors my grandmother had polished. I bet they didn't even see her. I bet they walked straight past her, perhaps even straight over her. Now, the stories go that some angry fairy, some witch, brought a curse, a curse. It started with the princess. The punishment was for the princess. They say that she fell into a deep sleep, but she fell into her slumber on the bed in her room where she lay, and that infection of sleep that sickness of slumber spread through the whole castle. The king, the queen, the lords, the ladies, the soldiers, the guards, the porters, the stable boys and the scullery maids all fell and slept where they lay. Not on a soft bed for a princess, on the stone floor. And overnight, so they say, whoever they are, the castle was covered with a briar, a thick thorn, so thick that no one could get through it. And they came, all oh, the princes came. They'd heard a story of a princess that needed rescuing, so they hacked their way through. You don't want to hear this bit. They hacked their way through a briar so thick that it grew back through them. They didn't survive. Apparently, if you go up to the hill, you can see the rusted armour. And still they came and they came, fewer and fewer over the years, and thicker and thicker the briar, and fewer and fewer people of the village, as this village slowly faded away, like the castle, into memory. <laughs> My mother stayed. She always believed that she would come back. My grandmother. And she was the last of her sisters. They all lived long, sad lives waiting. And the house passed to me with the strict instruction that I was to wait here for her. I don't believe in ghosts, but I've been told. Old man Peters, you see, he's been here all his life as well. He said he saw the prince. We haven't seen a prince around here for decades. He saw the prince go up to the castle and start hacking his way through. And he swears, old man Peters, and he's not a man given to lies. He swears that the briar did not grow back, that the prince was making his path through. Old man Peters swears he saw the prince cut away the bracken and the briar to reveal the castle door. And he swears that the castle guards are still at the door. Now, by now, 100 years later, they should be bone, dust and bone. And no, he said they were still there leaning against the wall, cheeks pink, eyes closed, asleep. He swears that the prince forced his way through the door, and as he did, he watched the guards reanimate, come back to some form of life I don't understand. He says it happened with a yawn. They say I'm going to see a ghost tonight, that she will return, that they will wake slowly in that castle, because he will break the curse, this prince, by placing a kiss on the princess's mouth. They say that the king and the queen will give him half the lands and the hand of the princess in marriage. That's why he's done it. I don't know how rich people do it. I don't know how the posh do it. But if you break into my house and kiss my daughter when she's asleep, you will not get half my lands. I don't have any lands. You will not get half my lands if I had lands. You will get what's coming to you. But then again, I'm not rich. I'm not a prince. I'm not a king. And how she will wake 
after a hundred years on that stone floor, what aches, what pains will she carry? But she will not know, will she? She would have been asleep. I hope she was asleep. If she was asleep, then this was one long, torturous night of nightmares for her. She's going to return here soon. She's going to come to this house one hundred years later. A house she'd just left with all her children in it. And she will return to find them all gone. And I'm going to have to tell her that she is now a ghost. She does not get half these lands. I think that's her coming down the path. She's young. Of course she's young. She was young. She looks like my mother. She has the face of my mother and my aunts. She looks tired. She looks broken. How am I going to tell her? All her children are gone. Welcome, Grandmother. Welcome back to your house. Have you ever thought about those side characters? When did you guess the story? Do you know what the story is? It's in this book. Of course, it's the story of the Sleeping Beauty. So many other characters in that castle. I think it's quite a sad story, really, when you think about it. Maybe we shouldn't think about it. Maybe I've thought about it too much. But that's OK, because that's what we can do with these stories. We can take and find a story and give it a twist. Maybe even one with a happier ending than this. I know it's supposed to have a happy ending, but think about it. I want to leave you with one last thought. It's a challenge, really. It's a question. Have you ever thought about Dave? Do you care about Dave? Hmm? You know Dave, don't you? Don't you know Dave? Dave appears in that... Um, that old story, that documentary. Have you seen it? It's a documentary film. It's set in a castle, another castle with a rich person who is cursed. So all the working people are trapped. You might have seen the documentary where all the working people get changed into things, into objects, into candelabras or clocks or plates or little chipped cups. Do you know which story I'm talking about? What's the one where all the candelabras and the plates and the chipped cups come together every night and sing and dance together because they're under a curse? Well, they'll be uh, changed into these objects forever, but they seem quite happy. You know it. You know it. Beauty and the Beast. Yes. And do you care about Dave? Hmm? Dave? You know Dave, don't you? Oh, no, that's because Dave's not allowed into the party with the dancing. No, he, you see, was another working person in this rich man's mansion. But he happened to be doing a particular job at a particular part of the mansion and he was turned into what he was doing. Dave's not allowed in because he was in one of the many bathrooms of the beast cleaning it. Dave got turned into a toilet brush. No, Dave! You can't come in, Dave! We're singing and dancing lovely songs with chipped cups and candelabras and timepieces and wardrobes, not with toilet brushes. You're the toilet brush for a beast, Dave. You stink! You stink! Stay out! Poor Dave. All Dave wants to do is sing and dance with the others. It's all right, Dave. Your story is safe with me. 
Now remember, the moral of this story is never ever kiss a toilet brush. Don't worry about me. I'm a trained storyteller and I've washed this twice. Thank you, the people of Manchester Libraries, for listening to my ghost story. Maybe you will give some stories a twist. You could write them or tell them or share them or tell this one. Retell it your own way. But please, whatever you do, don't forget Dave. Come on, Dave. Shall we go and have a party? <laughs>